Let's start at verse 17 and let us read collectively, please. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and rest us in the law, and make this thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And I'm confident that thou ourselves art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher to a baby which has the form of knowledge and of the truth and the law. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, doest thou steal. Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, doest thou commit adultery. Thou that abhorrest idols, doest thou commit sacrilege. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonor thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. As it is written. Amen. Amen. Uh, once again, we're going through our verse by verse throughout the book of Romans. And as we just read through verses 17 through 24, what we want to keep in mind is verses 17 through 24, they lie between chapter 1 of Romans, verse 18 through 20, through chapter 3, verse 20. And what do we find? And what is the Apostle Paul saying through Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 20? The big deal is, let's go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. In verse 18, it reads, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who hold the truth and the law. Back to Romans chapter 2, let's read verse 17. And it reads, Behold, thou, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. I want us to connect Romans 1.18 and keep in mind Romans 2 and 17. Go back to Romans 1.18 again. The latter part of the verse, it reads, who hold the truth in what? Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. Today our focus, we're going to be looking at the Jew which was given the law and how that Jew, which was given the law, had the truth contained in that law. Amen? And we're going to take a look and see how they did not keep the law. How not keeping the law. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2. Let's read verse 23. Romans 2 and 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law does what? Dishonors God. Why is this important? Because in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18 through Romans chapter 3 verse 20, God is after proving what? Romans chapter 3. Let's, let's start at verse, I'm sorry, let's start at verse 19, Romans 3, 19. It reads, now we know that whatsoever thing the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and how much of the world? Oh. All the world may become guilty before God. Right now what Paul is explaining, not just the Gentile world that we're about to study today, Romans chapter 2, verse 17 through 24, not just is the Gentile world guilty before God, but the law was given to the Jew to prove that Gentile plus who? 
plus Jew is all guilty before God. Continue, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We want to include no flesh being right now Jew and Gentile. Both parties right now uh, should be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. How about verse 23 of Romans chapter 3? It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of who? It was very easy for a Gentile to grasp and understand that in time past. Who struggled and really had a time embracing that doctrine that they fall short of the glory of God? Jew. The Jew. The Jew struggled with this doctrine. They struggled with this truth. But it's important for us to understand that why Romans is such a great, a great, or the first book that all of us should pay dire attention to is because it explains how man failed. It explains what is the big deal of why Jesus Christ was on the cross. It talks about how all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because we fall short of the glory of God, what by that is our punishment? Death. The wages of sin is what? Death. death. But now Romans, it opens up our eyes to why Christ's death and why he died on the cross. This is the big deal. We don't just talk about Jesus. We explain the significance that the word of God talks about why he was the one that we're going to come to find out. The Jew with the law, we're going to find out that they dishonor God. And I'm just going to spill the beans. The big deal about Jesus, what you're going to find out, what we're going to find out is he. He honored God. This is the big deal. We're going to see how things that the Jews did, that the Jews done with the law, they was not perfect in the keeping of it. And anyone who is not perfect in obeying God from the beginning of their life to the end of their life, and when you get to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it lets us know that because of Adam, we was all born in his similitude and his likeness anyway, of falling short of the glory of God. Paraphrasing that, not that I didn't quote that word for word. But the, but the big deal is what? Show me an individual who can stand before God and say that they honor of God in, every, in everything they do always and forever. This is why it is important for us to rejoice because we are accepted in who? The beloved. And the beloved did those things that sometimes are always honor God. Always. always. This is the big deal. This is why we are to understand why we should give ourselves attendance to read it and be careful to look at how the word of God magnifies and glorifies the one who we are accepted in, Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's go to Romans chapter 3. We're still there. Let's look at the first two verses in Romans chapter 3. First two verses. We want to get a concept of who the Jew is. Verse 1 reads of chapter 3, What advantage then have the who? The Jew. Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. This is totally in alignment with what verse 17 says of chapter 2. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. This was where they found the truth of God to them that we're going to see that they was to express to the who? To the world. Look on your handout that I gave you. It's verses you want to keep in mind when you study a passage like Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. Let's start at Genesis chapter 12, which I hand out all of these is KJV, King James Version, every verse in here. Verse 1 of Genesis 12 reads, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a who? Blessing. Blessing. What we want to first recognize first was that the Jew was to be, they was to be a blessing to the world. Let's continue. Verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse of thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The Jew, also when we think of the word Jew, we are to understand that they are the children of who? They are the children of Israel, amen? Come to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. 
<clears throat> Romans chapter 9. Let's start at verse 3. Paul says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are who? Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Something that we really want to grasp and we want to understand. And it's important for me to put the verse, the verses that's telling us certain things. I want you to look deeply at Romans 9, chapter 4, and I want you to look at You see that? You see that in Romans 9 and 4? Let's do that again. Who are Israelites to whom pertain of the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Do you know that from Genesis 12, you find out the outset, what's supposed to have been the service of the Jews? The service of the Jews, look at uh, Genesis 12 and 2 again with your hand out. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a what? Blessing. From the offset, God has in mind creating this nation, and this nation being a blessing to how many nations? Uh. All nations. But it's going to start with this nation, with them, that's going to be their, the service of God that they are to have to the whole world. The whole world. Look at verse 3 again. Genesis 12 and 3. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that cursed thee. And indeed shall how many? Oh. All families of the earth be blessed. God always had, even when he formed the nation of Israel by calling out Abram, that great nation was to be called the nation of Israel. Amen? He had in mind the salvation of the whole world, but Israel had the duty and the service of God to go forth with some information for the whole world to receive this blessing. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> with the information that they was to go out with, the Jew was to show the world how to honor God. Come to a moment. Let's, let, let's, let's rewind our Bibles all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. Why was it necessary for God to call Abram to tell him he's going to make of him a great nation and for that nation to be a blessing? Why, why was it necessary? Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel was the case that we're looking at. Starting at verse 1, Genesis 11 and 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they say, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto who? Heaven. Unto heaven. And let us read closely this with me. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of man built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all, and they have all one language, and they be, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. What does man at this time supposed to have their mind on? And where is it not? Come now to Genesis chapter 3. 
I presented a question, why did God have to bless Abram? Why did God have to say what he said in Genesis chapter 2? Why, why create a nation through which all nations would be blessed? Why? I, I mean, what went, what's going on? What are these individuals in Genesis 11 up to trying to make their name great? And what should they have been up to? Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verse 15. The fall have already taken place. God had told Adam, God had told Eve what his provision is for the sin that has now occurred and entered into the world. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the provision. That's the future outset that I'm pretty sure they actually didn't understand that that was the cross work of Jesus Christ soon to come. But what's my point? My point is that's exactly where their mind should have been at. Their mind should have been, listen, God put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Proof that verse 15, that God gave them a child to look forward to, listen and listen close, please don't lose track of this, is Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Next chapter, let's look at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have begotten a man from the Lord. They were supposed to be looking for God to have a child come through the woman and looking for that woman to do what? Crush the head of the sin that just came into the world when they ate of the tree that they were told not to eat of. They were not to be looking to do what? make a name for themselves and go into the heavens. That's why God did what he did in Genesis 11, and then immediately in Genesis chapter 12, do you know what God has in mind with the nation that he's going to make great? He has in mind Genesis 3.15. You catch that? He has in mind still doing what? Look again at Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the serpent that duke and that did what? Manipulated and deceived Adam and Eve. He's talking to the serpent and guess what he has in mind? Victory over the power of sin and death in Genesis 3 and 15. That's, what, that's where his mind is at. And guess where in Genesis 11, as they're building the Tower of Babel, they are supposed to be waiting for that child that's going to be conceived out of the woman. They are supposed to be hanging on dearly to, yo, why are we doing this? Let's not build us a, you know, something, a tower that can reach into the heavens. We should be waiting on the promise that the woman is going to conceive a child, and, 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 this, and that seed of the child is going to do what? Bruise the head of the serpent. This is where their mind ought be, and guess what? Those are the promises that God gave through the nation Israel that what? A virgin shall conceive a child. Linking it to what? Genesis chapter 1. 3 verse 1. 15. Come on, this is, this, this, is, this is basic. This is seriously, this is serious, basic, and that child is the one that the blessing is really going to be coming through, amen? It's the child. It's the child. It's the child. In Genesis chapter 3, tell me the only promise that they was given after the fall. Verse 15. Verse 15. Where is the promise in Genesis 3? It's in verse 15. It's right there. And it's about a seed of the woman. Amen. Amen. The Jew. Come with me to Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. Do you think it's important to know the Old Testament and the basic way the Old Testament flows for the sake of studying the Jew? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. This, 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 this is a big deal. We, I don't want to uh, beat this with a hammer, but when you talk about Jesus and you talk about why this nation, 
This nation was through whom Jesus will come, through whom the promises of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is based on. Psalms chapter 90. I want us to read the first two verses. Psalms chapter 90, the first two verses. <clears throat> Amen. Make that Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, first two verses. And it reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the what? The law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate day and night. The, the law was the witness of God's wisdom and God's understanding given to who? The Jews. The Jews to be a what to the world? The light. A light to the world. When we talk about when we talk about the law, we have to understand that this is where the Jews promises. This is where they're, this is where it lies, and this is the witness that God has separated them and given them his wisdom, his understanding for the sake of blessing the whole what? The whole world. The whole world. The whole world. Could the world be blessed in time past by not acknowledging the Jews as God, the Jews and not the law that was given to them? You had to acknowledge the Jew and the law that was given to them. The Jew, for the sake of you receiving a blessing, had to, had to, had to. Is the church today deeply ignorant of that doctrine? Yes. Deeply ignorant of acknowledging the Jew, the law, and the blessing that the Jew and the law was to be to the world. to the world. And we just want to we just want to point out something here. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, the psalmist says that he does what with the law? He delights in the law. He delights in the law. Let's go to Psalms uh, 119 right now. We're going to read verses 17 through 18. Psalms 119, verse 17 through 18. And it reads, Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Today in the age of grace, do we see the law as something that is wondrous, that from the law we receive a blessing from? The law is what the world needs to have in order to be saved and receive blessings. We, we recognize that we are not under it and that it has been now nailed to what? The cross. It's been nailed to the cross. It's been blotted out. It's been taken out of the way. Amen? Amen. But... As you just, like Jesus read in Psalms 119, verses 17 through 18, they saw, he said, I want to open my eyes, says verse 18, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Remember at the end of the lesson last week when it was uh, questions and comments after it was closed, they saw the law as a beautiful liberty and they saw their righteousness in that law. They saw it as wondrous and the, that's the way, guess what? That's the way that the Gentile world was to see that law as well. They were supposed to be overly impressed with the Jew, the service of God, and the law that God gave to Moses to give to Israel. The Gentiles and all nations were supposed to be like, wow. They were supposed to be like, wow, I want to get under that and become a proselyte as well. I want to follow that if I if you want to receive the. That's it. 
Now, once again, this is simplistic, but yet it's drastically missing from the church today, isn't it? Drastically missing from the church today. The church today, they take this attitude. They say, open my eyes to that law. They see the law as something, yo, let's do it. Let's keep it. And let's encourage each other to do it and to keep it. I'm going to watch you to see if you're keeping it. That's how the church world, 90% of it moves and functions today. Sister, the reason why you ain't blessed because you ain't been giving your tithes. Mm -hmm. Or you know what? That's all you give is your tithes. The true, the, the true one over and shaking together come in your offering on top of your tent. Is that rampant throughout the church world today? Yes. It's rampant throughout the church world today. Say Psalms 119, go to verse 97. Verse 97 reads, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my what? Meditation all day. That truly sounds like someone who is under the law. That's their meditation all day. They are under it. They don't even, you understand? As you read that, I don't see that as a weight. I don't see that as a yoke of bondage with just that understanding. You know, you take away the books of Romans through Philemon, you won't see the law as something that's like that, that you should not be under. You take away the books of Romans through Philemon, the law is glorious, the law is awesome, and it lies the promises and the blessings of God. Remove the law from Israel, and where do their blessings lie? God. All their blessings was given under the keeping of the what? Oh, wow. That's it. That's where all their blessings lie, right there. Deuteronomy chapter 4. That's, it, it, it's, it's so refreshing Refresh me when you understand why the word of God speaks to Israel the way it speaks to Israel about the law. Amen? That's the beautiful part of right division. We don't oppose what the word of God is saying about the law to whom God is saying it to. You catch that? We understand that he is saying everything that he's saying to Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let's start reading at verse 5. And it reads, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do, that ye should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them read closely. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the who? Nations. The nations. Hear me. The nations, the only way that the nations was supposed to was supposed to see God at work in the Jew was with the law that God had given the Jew. The nations was supposed to be impressed with the Jew, with the law that was given to the Jew, and that law that was given to the Jew was a blessing to the nations, and they called that the service of God, Romans chapter 9, verse 4. That was their service to the world. Go, go show the world my law, and, I'm, and the world is to see my law as the wisdom and understanding of God. At that time, that's where God's wisdom and understanding lie, in the law. It lied right there in the law. Not to acknowledge the law was not to acknowledge the wisdom that God gave to his people to serve the world with. And if you didn't want to acknowledge that, you said bye-bye to the blessing. You said bye-bye to the blessing. That's, that's time past. Amen. That's time past, doctrine. That's time past, doctrine. Let's continue to read in the middle of verse 6. In the sight of all the nations, nations which shall hear all these statutes, those laws, right? That word statutes, those commandments, all these statutes, and watch what the nation is supposed to say. And say, surely this great, it's not plural, it's singular, nation is a wise and understanding people. I remember I used to go to a church that never, uh, never rightly divided the word of God. They didn't understand how to rightly divide it. 
So they used to use terminologies like give God some glory, glory to God. And the, the terminology that they used, it was based off doctrine that was given to the Jews. But I will read myself and the pastor will read himself into the scripture. And then the music will get played and we will wave our hands and we will sweat like we was on a treadmill. And we call that giving glory to God. <laughs> The true glory to God is to acknowledge the wisdom that he had given to a particular people at a particular time through a particular man. At this time, it was God giving it to Moses to give to Israel to give to the world. In this age of grace, in this dispensation of the grace of God, we have to acknowledge the doctrine given from Christ to Paul to give to all nations. And it's not the same doctrine that Moses gave to Israel to give to the world. And this is truly how you give God glory. And they would have been giving glory to God that they as the nations who will say what they said at the end of verse 6. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. It's a whole total contrast from Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, let us build us a tower. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real smart. They are contrast to Romans chapter 1. This is how they was professing themselves to be wise and they became fools. We're going to build us a tower. We're going to make our name great. We're going to reach it up to the heavens. Let's do that. Yeah, that's smart, man. I'm going to help you do it. I'm going to take care of the mortar. I'm going to take care of this. We just going to start building. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Ooh. Fools. 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 What they were supposed to be doing was to have in mind what the nation of Israel is going to be hanging on to. Do you know all the covenants, all the laws, all the promises, they all revolve around the one individual, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the God, man, who is going to what? Fulfill the law. And the fulfillment of the law had everything in a link, in a connection for the sake of the nation of Israel with the seed of the one. they supposed to be focusing themselves on, man, I wonder... I wonder if sister so-and-so holding the seed of the woman. I wonder if sister so-and-so holding the seed of the woman. I wonder if sister so-and-so holding the seed of the woman. Why? That's where the promise of Genesis 3.15 lies in the who? Seed of the woman. It's such a big deal. Ask King Herod how he felt about it. I want to kill that God child. Amen. Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. Amen. Had the, had, had the Magi look for where the child will be born at. To do what? And guess what he believed and understood? Kingdom. It's going to be king. Here was concerned about his what? His throne. But that's in connection with Israel, their covenants and their promises that Jesus Christ will reign on the king. Of, he, he will reign on the throne of who? David. David. They, everything I'm speaking is Jesus Christ according to the what program? Prophetic. Prophetic kingdom prophecy program. This is essential for us to know because who are we talking about? The Jews. And, the law. and in time past, the big deal was <coughs> the prophecy and that earthly kingdom. So they're trying to build a tower in Genesis 11 to reach up to heaven and God got what in mind at the time? The earth. Pressing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know what would be real smart? Let's take our attention up there. <laughs> Foolish. And God had to do what he did and now give us some insight, some doctrine, and some information concerning why Israel, why he created Israel, and what this nation would show off and give off God's wisdom as understanding. Still in Deuteronomy 4, looking at verse 7. Watch what it still continues to say. For what nation is there so great who have God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Excuse me. Look at verse 8. And what nation is there so great that has statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I sat before you this day. Do you see how they saw that law as something glamorous, wondrous, beautiful, that it was something to meditate on all day and night as a Jew. Mm -hmm. How when we run to Paul and we open up 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we understand the comfort that comes from God, they found comfort in the law. Mm -hmm. We find comfort in God according to Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery under grace, not under the law. They saw their comfort in the law. 
They saw it as a comfort. They saw it as a shield. And not just was they to see it that way. They was to tell the whole world. That's how they should see it. And in doing so, the whole world, by understanding this law, was to do what? That's how they would be honoring God. That's how they were to be honoring God. Let's continue. Let's open our Bibles now to the book of Matthew. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. And we really could have stayed. Uh, we still in the Old Testament. I know when you open our Bibles, the publishers print the New Testament when you get to the book of Matthew. But we understand by the word of God that the New Testament begins with what? The death of the testator. Death of the testator. Amen. And that's not in Matthew chapter 1, is it? No. <laughs> Amen. So it's just important for us to recognize that. It's important for us to understand that. But Matthew chapter 15, we understand that the, the Jew was given the law, the service of God, and that the rest of the world will find their blessings and blessing that nation, believing what God is doing with that nation, believing that God is given to that nation, and that they was to find a blessing in that, and that would be the way the world and the Jew was to honor God. Let's see, as we open up the book of Matthew, chapter 15, an incident to see how that's going. Let's start at verse 1, Matthew 15, chapter 1. Then came Jesus to scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, it's important for all of us to recognize whenever you see the word scribe, whenever you see the word Pharisee, I know most of us know this, but it just does something to really say this. They are Jews. Amen? Mm -hmm. Scribes and Pharisees were Jews. It's important. So, make, so remember, he's going to have a conversation. He's going to receive some opposition from the who? The Jews. Jesus himself is going to receive opposition from the Jews. Amen? And it reads, verse 2. Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat with bread. Did you catch something that was that, that was off base already in verse two? Mm -hmm. Tradition. Tradition of who? Yeah, Come on, thank you. Come on. What is that not saying? True. It's not saying the commandments of who? Oh God. Amen. Amen. It's not saying the commandments of God. Before we go on any further, leave your hand here. Leave your hand in Matthew 15. Go to Deuteronomy, where we was, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Because where do the blessings lie again in time past? With the Jew, with the law, with the law them keeping it, them doing it, them doing it. Question, them doing Pieces here and pieces. How much? Oh. All of it? Not 98%? 100. Is he, and I'm being like, kind of like, okay, Rondell, really? 100. Because the moment that they pull out and don't do all of it, is that a blessing or is that a curse? Curse. It's a curse. Okay, so it's important that we remember in Matthew 15 that the scribes and Pharisees asking Jesus, why the traditions of the elders your disciples are not following? Deuteronomy chapter 4, let's read verse 2. And it reads, you shall not, or ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. What did that verse just remind us of and tell us? They are not to do what? Add, Add or, take away. or take away. If they do any of those, what's in jeopardy? The blessings that are in jeopardy. Amen? So, back to Matthew 15. Amen. Matthew 15, we got some tradition of the elders. Tradition of the elders is not a synonym to the commandment or the word of God. Okay? Looking at verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you, or why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? This is awesome. Jesus is the word, so he knows the word in and out. So what's being said is that, is that the scribes and Pharisees 
has added something that the word of God giving to Moses to give to Israel did not place in his word, did not place in his law. Okay? Something bad, wrong, trouble had for those scribes and Pharisees. They keep this attitude, okay? Verse 4, for God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that curse a father or mother, let him die to death. Wow, that's in the word of God. That's put, that's in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. That's in Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. Do you understand that when sons and daughters in time passed, when they didn't honor father and mother, and, 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 and I say this gracefully and seriously, if there's anyone that's listening that's saying, I'm keeping the law, and I know you got seven-day events, you got a lot of people who keep the law, or believe that they're keeping the law. They're not keeping the law. They believe that they're keeping the law. Next time your son or your daughter don't honor you, do you understand that if you're trying to keep the law, when you go to Exodus 21 and 17 or Leviticus 21 and 9, do you know that the, that the father and the mother was to have the child put to death? You want to keep the law? And if you and hear this, if you don't keep that one, James chapter 2 verse 10 says you're guilty of what? You're guilty of them all. I'm not encouraging you to keep the law. We're no longer under the law in this age of grace. God is not imputing your trespasses onto you. The law has been laid aside because the time past program of God dealing through the Jew, through Israel, to the world with the doctrine that was given to Moses to dispense out. That's not what's going on right now. It's not what's going on right now. And not knowing that many individuals are dishonoring God and thinking that they're, that they're giving God glory. Amen? Many, many, many. Uh, verse 5. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, but whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of who? God. Of God of non effect by your what? Tradition. Tradition. This is Christ's response to them. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah's prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is what? But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what? They're adding to what was given to Moses. They're taking from what was given to Moses and saying, no, this is the word of God to you. And it's not. And Christ says, when you do that, your worship is in vain. It's empty, it's empty, it's empty, it's empty, it's empty. It's empty. You are not honoring me. You are not honoring me. Now, this is such a big deal because right now in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24, we are looking at how with the law, although the Jew make their most out of the law, they are not doing what with the law? They're not keeping it. They're not honoring God. What you're boasting in, you're not keeping. You guys are hypocrites. You're just like the Gentiles. You fall short of the glory of God. You fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans chapter 1, from verse 18 to chapter 3, verse 20 is. It's God's proclamation that all men fall short of his glory. It's all men fall short of his glory. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I don't know if we realize how big and how important it is that when we share the gospel with anyone and everyone, you know the first step for them to start to believe that they need Christ's righteousness imputed to them is for them to know, trust, and be convinced that they fall short of the glory of God. If they don't think they fall short of the glory of God, they certainly don't think that they need to believe a gospel that will save them if they believe that what they do and how they do it, God is pleased with. 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says something simplistic but powerful and inspiring. 
2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, and it reads, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Come to Romans chapter 5, we're keeping that verse in mind. Romans chapter 5, we're keeping that verse in mind. He said, if our gospel is hid, it is hid by those who are lost. Do you know what is so detrimental for that? Verse 12, Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin is so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The gospel is hid, meaning not believe, from those who don't believe that death was passed from Adam unto all men. It's hid. I don't believe in the Adam thing that you're talking about by me being a similar to in the likeness of him and along with him, Romans 5 says, unrighteousness, disobedience, condemnation lives and lies with being in Adam likeness. I don't believe it. The gospel is in it. It's in In Adam all die. In Adam all die. I don't believe that. Okay, well the gospel is hid from me. But it is hid by their willing unbelief. Willing. It's hid from their willing unbelief. Back to Matthew chapter 15. And when our willing unbelief, when it hides the gospel from us, because once again, it's our willing unbelief. I love the terminology of the word of God. Matthew chapter 5. Let's start at verse. Let's start at verse 12. Now remember what was just said. Jesus told them that, listen, you guys are rever you guys bring reverence to the tradition of the elders and not the commandments of God. You are adding to my word, you are taking from my word, and you're not honoring my word. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. You, you, you're really doing my word at this service. When Christ said that. Look at verse 12. This is how the disciples, uh, this is what they perceive from the scribes and Pharisees. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were what? Offended after they heard this saying. Offended. The Pharisees upset. Oh, so we so you said what the what the elders added to is not the word of God. No, it's not. And they was offended. I dare you. And Christ's response is, 13, but he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father have not planted shall be rooted up. And this is such an awesome and awesome thing. I use these verses when I did not understand how to rightly divide your truth used to run me up the wall and I totally did not understand. Do you understand the gospel is no longer hid when you believe what the word of God says it says about you. Bye bye to it being here. You want to be a plant that gets rooted up from your unbelief to belief. You simply believe not the traditions of the elders but the commandments of God. And in this age of grace 1 Corinthians chapter 14 it tells us that those commandments was given to the apostle Paul. Amen. This is the big deal. And the commandments of God that was given to the Apostle Paul is the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And Romans 6, 14 lets us know that we are not under law but under grace. So it's not the same for those of you listening, everybody present. It's not. Don't think of Paul commandments as the commandments of Moses. They're two different. It, the word command mean God told them strictly what to say. He gave Moses a law to give of do, 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 do. And continue to do to receive the blessing. In the age of grace, in the dispensation of the grace of God, he gave Paul doctrine and commandments that consist of us being accepted and to be loved by believing on what he has done and not what we do. It's unique, it's special. In verse 14 of Matthew chapter 15 reads, Christ says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both fall into the ditch. Meaning, you got unbelievers 
who's being teachers of the word of God and adding to it and taking from it. That's another thing when it comes to that translation issues. Believe it or not, it really is. But, but adding to and taking from the word of God, blind leaders telling them to believe the tradition of my mama said, my daddy said, and yada yada, whoever, whoever, whoever was, clergyman said. To believe that, and you got people believing those traditions of the elders and amening them from sun up to sundown, blind, leading, blind, both on their way to, sad to say, that lake of fire. Because they are freely believing to believe what mama said about salvation, what daddy said about salvation, what this person said, what that person said, what that clergyman said, what that clergyman said, and not what simply God said. Blind leading blind. Blind leading blind. They both fall into a ditch. Amen. Amen. Sad, 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 sad. Come to Ephesians chapter 1. Come to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible boasts and gives Glory to Jesus Christ in a way that I'm pretty sure those of us who study, those of us who read the scriptures, that we constantly, and I said this in Sunday school, we constantly continue to become a factual, passionate, with being overly and overly impressed because the word of God, you cannot exhaust it. You never get to the point that I've heard enough about Jesus. I know who he is. I know what he has done. I know the riches that I have in him. I know I'm accepted. I'm accepted in the beloved. Like, okay, like, I know that. We, we relax. No, it, God continues to over impress us with his wisdom, his grace, and his glory when we continue to continue to read what we have in Christ by simply believing. It's mind blown what we have. In Christ, because we simply believe. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I said all that to say in verse 10, it's really giving glory to God. It's really giving glory to Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, and it reads that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in who? In Christ. In Christ both which are in heaven, in which are on earth, even in who? Him. In him. And in him is in Christ. It is in Christ. Now, in order for that to happen, in order for that to happen, God the Father, it proves that God the Father cherishes, God the Father treasures, and God the, Father's, God the Father honors Jesus Christ. That everything in this earthly realm and everything in the heavenly places, God is going to bring the promises of Jesus Christ according to the prophecy program, the promises of Jesus Christ according to the mystery program, they all live, have their being and their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And the significant thing of that, it proves for that to be the case, Jesus Christ brought some terrific and glorious honor to God the Father. He brought some honor to God the Father that God the Father takes honor even in him. It's something how God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, and God the Son, how they all bounce the honor that each one give off of each other. This is so important. When you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, you also start to understand how God the Holy Ghost does not function and operate in the age of grace the way he functions and operates in the time past and in the ages to come. His, and in the ages to come. Time passed, someone was sick. They get healed. The elders pray for him, it says in James. Healing, healing is a normality of seeing God power in an external way in the prophecy program. By sight. They were giving signs, wonders, and miracles that our deacon Jeremy remind us, they walked by sight. God gave Moses signs, wonders, and miracles to go get the children of Israel and pull them out of Egypt with signs, wonders, and miracles. Sight things. External. See his power externally around you. 
see him working out of you externally was the prophecy program. In the age of grace, the Holy Ghost, in this percentage of the grace of God, the Holy Ghost don't operate that way. The Holy Ghost don't operate that way. When you read Exodus chapter 4 and you see what God told Moses, he told Moses and gave Moses external power that I'm with you. Now that's so essential to understand for the sake of rightly dividing the word of truth, but at the same time I said that just to bring the emphasis on how God the Father proves his honor for God the Son. Open your Bibles to John chapter 8, please. John chapter 8. We in time pass, right? John chapter 8. John chapter 8, Israel was still in the focus, but we, we, we want to see how God the Father honored Jesus Christ. This, how God the Father honored God the Son, and how they both respected and honored one another in an equal esteem of each other. All right, boy. Where do I want to start at? Let's look at verse 29. 8 and 29, and it reads, And he... And he that sent me is with me. The Father have not left me alone. And Christ says, for I do what? Always. Always those things that please him. Look at verse, look at verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. They saying that Jesus is possessed by a devil. In verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I do what? Honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. Continue. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Drop to verse 54. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that what? Honoreth me, of whom ye say, that he is your God. Did you see what verse 54 said? Verse 54, Jesus said, it is my Father that honoreth me. It is God the Father, he's honoring me. Who knows what the word honor means? To honor someone, you are doing what? Esteeming them. You are esteeming them. You are esteeming them. And he esteemed them. Go to Matthew chapter 17. He didn't just esteem them privately. He esteemed them how? He also esteemed them publicly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is awesome when it talks about how the Holy Ghost teaches us to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Because right now, we're about to see God compare Jesus Christ among prophets of Israel's program who these 12, or who Peter and James and John, whom they esteem. They esteem to right now Jesus is going to be alongside. Chapter 17 of Matthew, and it reads, After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his uh, remnant clothes was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias walking with him. What happened? Peter, James, and John are walking on the mountain, okay? In the midst of just Peter, James, John, and Jesus appear, these are big names of you are a Jew. Moses and Elias. That Elias is Elijah. These are big names to Israel, okay? Let's continue to read. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. What is Peter doing? Or what is he expressing when expressing and choosing the choice of words to do what he wanted to do for all three of them? Honoring them. He's honoring them, but he's honoring Moses and Elias in the same understanding that he's doing with Jesus. Meaning he's doing what? He's not exalting Jesus above them. 
He's not honoring Jesus above them. He sees Jesus as awesome, as a prophet, as he sees Moses and Elias. He sees them in the same light. Let's build three tabernacles. He don't say, and the word of God does not say that he said, let's build three tabernacles, but we'll make yours a little bigger. No, let's build three tabernacles. Let's build three tabernacles. Amen? Let's continue. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What did he say? Hear ye him. Hear ye him. What does God the Father with the voice does? Hear him. Him. I understand you see Moses, you see Elias, and I did this for a purpose. It's a reason all three of these, all three together now. And this mount of transfiguration. And as you continue, verse 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. Listen to this. And so Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Verse 8 is vital. And when they had lifted him up their eyes, they saw how many men? No man saved Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountains, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell this vision to no man. Until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So they would so 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 they would tell the vision. And in the vision, they would say, listen, 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 guys. Moses was on one side, Elias was on one side, but the Father spoke from heaven, and when he spoke, I'm telling you, it was just Jesus alone. He said, Here, Jesus. This Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than what Moses was. When you when you read the book of Hebrews, it talks about how Jesus is so much more than what Moses was. He's more. He, he is more. He's more. They had no problem. Some, some, of the, some of the believers, some of the Jews in the earth, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had no problem believing that he was a prophet, but I don't know if he is the one that Moses and the prophets said will come. That, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's the one, if he is the Christ. You understand the significance of this? Let's get ready to close. Come to second, Peter, with me. 2 Peter, chapter 1. They were just at, they were just on the mount where a transfiguration took place, right? 2 Peter, chapter 1. Let's see this, let's see this account spoken of again. And once again, guess why this account has to be spoken of? Because in the book of Hebrews to Revelation, who's the focus? The same focus as throughout all scripture. Jesus Christ. Now, Peter and everybody else are still trying to prove to the Jews that this Jesus was and is the very Christ. That's the big deal, okay? Uh, I said, did I say 1 Peter or 2 Peter? 2 Peter. Awesome, awesome. 2 Peter. I was in 1 Peter. Okay, 2 Peter. Let's start at verse 16. 2 Peter, verse 16. It says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen close. But we were witnesses of his who? Of his majesty. For he received from God the Father what? Honor. Honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I, whom, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. They were witnesses. Listen, listen. Moses, he didn't resurrect and say that he was going to die and walk and be among us. Elias didn't resurrect and say he was going to walk around and be among us. Jesus said he was going to resurrect. He said he's going to be among us and guess what? He even told us don't even tell of the vision until after I resurrect. Don't even tell. Look at Verse 18, and this voice which came, came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mount. In the holy mount. My purpose for going there was to prove how God the Father honors the Son, how he treasures the Son. How he treasures, how he cherishes Jesus. Last portion of scripture, we close out the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. Because now, as you continue to read the book of Romans, from chapter 1, verses 18, to chapter 3, verse 20, <coughs> of all men fall short of the glory of God, 
What's the hope for mankind? Where do we turn? To Jesus. We turn to Jesus. We turn to Jesus. Let's start at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. We read a couple verses and close. 15 reads, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were things created. Who is it talking about? Who is it talking about? Jesus Christ. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. I want you to see that it's talking about not just God, but hear me. And I'm doing no disservice, but a, but a service of truth to the word of God. It's esteeming God the Son. God the Father is fine. God the Holy Ghost is fine with understanding the oneness that they have, but they put God the Son, Jesus Christ, on a display for the world to see their righteousness, their goodness, their graciousness. Do you, you understand that? Their power. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by who? Him. And for who? Him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn and the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That in all things he might have the preeminence. What, what does that word preeminent mean? Superior, above all. Superiority. You, we are supposed to look at God the Son and exalt him and know that we are doing justice to the word of God. Verse 19, and, and we close. For it pleased the Father that in who? That in him should all the fill in this world. That in, that in God the Son, that in Jesus Christ should all the fullness dwell. So get this, where the Jew failed that with the law and bringing that honor to God, they dishonored God. Jesus Christ was the one that honored him. And how many things? All, all things. How many times? Sometimes or always. Always. So when you so when we say we accept it in the beloved, we accept it in the beloved, knowing that the beloved always did, always done, always said, always, 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 anything and everything, he did those things that please God. That's what you accepted it. And that is nothing short of amazing. Thanks be glory to you.